60% of our body is water, right? 71% is surface water. It's so obvious, it's so obvious that we feel happy, fulfilled, relaxed when we are close to the ocean. When I started surfing, I was like in my late 30s. Uh, the, the biggest benefit I got from that was surf community. Yeah, but what surf community brought me is that I felt very comfortable. Because in the ocean, there is no makeup, there is no facial breaths, there is no phone. It's you have to be you. And because when you are you, you and you are distressed from everything which you put on yourself to be something special to the others, it's so relaxing. And we'd be happy and healthy if our ocean is not healthy. We are here to recognize the intrinsic value that the ocean brings to each of us every single day, whether it's through surfing or through therapy or through just providing peace and relaxation. But there's a lot of other reasons that our oceans are incredibly important to us. Um, and the, the biggest one is, is actually oxygen. We get as much as 70% of the oxygen we breathe every single day from plankton in the ocean. Billion people approximately on our planet that actually depends on seafood primarily as their number one source of nutrition. So seafood is incredibly important. Climate regulation, our oceans regulate our global climate. Our oceans allow us to transport people, transport goods, transport services. Also economics, a lot of people are employed by the ocean. I am one of those people. Um, so that's, we get all of this from Mother Ocean. She's incredibly, incredibly important to our livelihoods and our existence as human beings on this blue planet. But we have to protect our oceans. So what are we protecting our oceans from? This could be a much longer list. I tried to not go super, super doomsday on you all. Uh, but there are sort of three main buckets of challenges that our oceans are currently facing right now. And the first is pollution. Um, pollution can take many forms. When it comes to ocean pollution, there is the visible stuff like trash and plastics, but it's affecting not only uh, the animals and the ecosystems, but it's affecting us too. And then there's the invisible pollution, things like chemicals and nutrients, heavy metals, and even sewage. That's a problem that we see a lot here in Los Angeles. Our oceans are actually severely impacted from climate change. They're acidifying. Our oceans are actually getting more acidic, which impacts animals that grow their own calcium carbonate shells, which, believe it or not, is a lot more in the ocean that you then folks might think that do that. Um, it's actually reducing the amount of oxygen in our oceans. Um, more robot water essentially can hold less oxygen. So that's what's happening there. Our, our oceans are getting warmer, which is causing that. It's also causing the sea levels to rise. More robot water takes up more space. So it's causing that our ocean levels to rise. Um, habitats are getting squeezed, animals are moving and shifting to places that they wouldn't normally be, and we're getting pretty extreme weather. And the last thing on here is resource extraction, and there's a lot that fits under there, but it's essentially anything that we can extract from the ocean and use to our benefit, right? So that can be seafood, overfishing is a huge issue across the entire planet. Um, we're fishing, we're getting very, very good at fishing. We can find fish a lot more easily now, and they're having a harder time getting away from us, so overfishing is a big issue. Um, there's, I also have harmful aquaculture up on here. Aquaculture can be a beautiful thing. It can also be bad too. Um, and then offshore oil and gas drilling and offshore mining. So literally physically extracting resources from a prop, from, uh, our oceans can be incredibly harmful. That's a long list of bad things. So I'm going to stop there. Um, but I want to leave you with a number and that number is 419.16 parts per million. You're probably like, what on earth does that number mean? Um, and that's actually a, a reading that I pulled last night from a, uh, it's what they call the Keeling Curve. It's a continuous observation of atmospheric carbon dioxide that is taken at the Mount Loa uh, Laboratory. And this is the amount of CO2 that's in our atmosphere. And it just goes to show that this is one of those issues that when I first started in this career over a decade ago, climate change was a future issue. It was something that we were worried about because it was coming. It's no longer a future issue. Climate change is here, it's present, and it's already causing huge impacts. And we're at the top about one of those. I consider myself an animal advocate. This can speak for their story. I've worked in and around them. I know they're uh, this, you know, social and non stuff community. So I'm going to speak on behalf of the animal community and tell you a story about what's going on in our ocean right now. I'm going to introduce to you first the uh, protagonist of our story, the hero. This is where you as audience can cheer. Yeah. Right, so for kelp forest. For kelp forest. This is a habitat out in our own local oceans that is critical. It is the rainforest of the sea. This is the environment with these beautiful um, algae that provide habitat, protection, nursery grounds, food, um, all of these amazing things for the animals that exist out there. It also provides things for us products. 
we talk, teach kids all the time. We always say, you know, who likes ice cream? Who brushes their teeth? Well, kelp is in those products, so we all rely on them every day. Um, and again, like Emily said, it produces oxygen. They sequester carbon, so it helps us combat climate change. Kelp forests are true here. There will be no change in that. It is fact. The kelp forests are needed for us, for our planet, for ourselves, and the animals out there. So let's talk about the vivid. Wait, here is surgeons, those purple spiky things that you may have seen out in our brain gallery. Um, these are an animal that purple spiky balls have a little ring of five teeth and they can pour or gnaw through uh, so many things. Rocks, it can gnaw through the whole fat or the anchor of a kelp plant, which means that if they gnaw through those kelp plant anchors, the kelp plant gets released, the kelp forest gets destroyed. They also like to eat the kelp plants, so if they're not eating it, they're just releasing it up into the water and again, destroying the kelp forest. We talk a lot about a term called keystone, keystone species. Keystone species are species that are critical in a habitat and ecosystem. They are um, a species that cause cascading effects to the animals in and around them, to their habitats and the ecosystems. And so these key players, play critical roles in the balance of our kelp forest. We have our sunflower sea star, our sea otter, and our California sheep head. The important thing that makes them keystone are truly important in the balance is that they are predators to the sea urchins. And for one reason or another, their populations have decreased over the years. And our waters are warming and becoming more polluted because of uh, the main thing that we all want to share with you here today is that, you know, with, uh, with choosing your community, choosing any kind of community you want to join together, we are faster, we share ideas, we brainstorm, your community will give you resources, how and what you should do. And um, let's start with Round 12 organization that got started to support women would experience trauma in their healing and recovery through surf therapy. So they incorporate surf um, with trauma-informed care, somatic approaches, uh, mindfulness, eco-therapy, uh, root therapy. No plastic, no leper. And so they have people pledge in ways to reduce their plastic consumption. So Candice is one of the founders of Joint Serpent Moms. So this is a non-profit who does an amazing job connecting moms. So we're a non-profit and our focus is maternal, mental, and physical health. So what we do essentially is, um, as you can see here, we call that a surf swap. So you come down to the beach with your kids and you will care about another mom or another carer. And You'll decide between the two of you who's going to surf for the first hour and who's going to uh, wash the kids. And then you swipe. So that's is the mom or the carer because, you know, you don't get time for yourself. So we provide safe spaces for you to come down and take care of your mental health or just the health of your spiritual. We do beach cleanups. We, um, we encourage after every meetup, spend five minutes to pick up plastic and then 5% of each subscription. So it's an annual su subscription, $52 a year. And 5% of that will go towards, uh, we choose a different nonprofit every year. Hi, I'm you, we met Nick, and I started this year um, a surf therapy company for kids called Nathan Therapeutic. And it's mainly for kids in the neurodivergent population. And so a lot of people think that only means autism spectrum. That can be one thing. It could be ADHD, it could be um, intellectual learning challenges. Um, but the common denominator for these kids is sensory processing, and that's the way we take in all the information. We're not having a good output like motor skills or cognitive skills, and then that leads into our emotional skills. Um, and so what's amazing is in my work, I started to realize as a surfer, hey, what I'm doing in a clinic can be achieved in the water and on the beach. Um, the way the waves move, that, that targets our inner ear and our phalanx and our equilibrium. Um, the, everything we're doing in surfing from paddling to popping up, that's targeting um, receptors we have in our muscles and joints, and it's giving us body awareness. And when we get body awareness, um, we get self-regulation, but the oceans are already giving us self-regulation. So then it's like a powerhouse of self-regulation. And then the kids specifically, their common denominator is they don't feel confident, they have low self-esteem, 
Um, and then there's a lot of resulting emotional challenges. So anxiety, depression that come from that. And so for surfing for them, it gives them that opportunity to get grounded physically in their bodies and their nervous system, um, to develop motor skills, to develop emotional skills, and then to show up and have um, a sense of self. And it's been really powerful for me to be a part of um, and just hear their confidence and how they show up now in the world. Shelly from Dream Team Society. We were born in 2020. And yeah, we were born out of a need to congregate people together. It's LGBTQIA, LMNOP group. And basically, we just want people to surf together who need community and who are not homophobic, transphobic, racist, all that good stuff. But we do lessons, we do meetups, we do beach cleanups. I'm six foot six, same height as uh, as Michael Jordan. I he and my <laughs> <laughs> yes, he was. Um, I'm a professor at the University of Southern California. I'm in the Division of Biophysiology and Physical Therapy. Uh, I run a research lab called the Applied Movement uh, and Pain uh, Laboratory. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our project that we're calling now, Project Stoke. I really love to surf. I mean, I really love to surf. Uh, and the reason that I love to surf so much is that in my 20s, I developed a series of chronic pain conditions uh, that sort of came out of nowhere. And when I moved out here to California, I got in the water and started surfing just why everybody else starts surfing. It's really cool. Uh, I just can't avoid trying to try it. And then when I got out of the water, I would notice, I don't have any pain. What's going on with this? And then, uh, you know, the pain would come back and then I would do it again. Wait a minute, I don't have any pain. This is really weird. Um, and so sort of time after time of having that experience, um, what happened was that I gained confidence that I had this ability to regulate pain. And once I had that confidence that I could regulate pain, somehow pain just that evaporated, we disappeared. Um, and so there was something very transformative about the waves. And for a long time, I thought, okay, maybe that's just my thing. I'm, I'm grateful that I have a thing that I can do, but everybody probably has, has a different thing. I don't know if I can construct a scientific project around this that, that people are gonna take seriously and, and fun. Um, and I think it's really a testament to the intersection between art and science, because I came across, as many, many of you probably have seen the documentary on Netflix, Resurface, about using surf therapy for uh, PTSD survivors. It apps and so the way that those veterans were describing their experience resonated very deeply with me. And so I decided to try to create a scientific project around this uh, to basically be able to expand access to these ideas and concepts to uh, the more people. So uh, I'm a scientist, so I'm contractually obligated to show you data. Uh, but I promise this is the one and only data slide that I'm going to show you. Uh, so uh, in this project that we, uh, this pilot project that we're running this year, we're taking patients with very complex crime pain. Uh, that are known as uh, chronic overlapping pain conditions, or COPCs. Uh, we're enrolling them and we're taking them through uh, four weeks uh, of surf therapy. Uh, this is work that I'm doing with Natalie and Tracy. Uh, and so here is our first group of uh, four patients. They ranged in age from 35 to 51. Um, there were three females and one male uh, in this first group. Um, and what you see there, each column is a different surf session one week after the next week. These are not highly experienced surfers. In fact, only one of them had sort of prior surfing experience and the others were just very, very curious about surfing, comfortable in being in the ocean, but not, not uh, skilled surfers. The thing that I hope you can appreciate even from the back is that everything is going like this, down, a lot. Um, so for, ex for example, we have somebody in the, at the end there going from a seven out of 10, now to a one out of 10. This is absolutely extraordinary. These are not like pain level changes that you would often expect for people with this duration of, of very debilitating uh, chronic pain. Uh, so a couple other things to notice, it comes back, right? They're, by the time they come to surf session two, their pain is back up. Um, and so it's, it, as you might expect, surfing is not curative of a long chronic pain process. But when you dig into the statistics of what's going on here, is a little bit of my own experience. From week to week to week, the pain drops are getting a little bit steeper. They're getting a little bit better each time this repeats. And so the hope is that if we can extend this out further, expand access to, th uh, to this kind of therapy. We're measuring brain waves at the beach now, which is pretty fun. Uh, so this is a device called a Muse. 
Uh, it measures uh, EEG or electroencephalography of the, of the brain. Uh, and I've got a fantastic research team of undergrads and traffic at the beach. It's, it's a kind of a challenge. An airplane flies over and all, all hell breaks loose. <laughs> As Ivana said earlier, I have this room in my lab uh, where this new equipment is and I've called it the future. And so when people come to it, I say, you're coming to the future, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> um, and so what this is, is what will hopefully be a really state of the art, virtual reality, a uh, surfing simulator that's not designed for game purposes. It's really, we're building it in a patient-centered way from the ground up to see if we could replicate that kind of therapeutic experience, but in a way that we could expand access to a broader uh, uh, patient population. This version platform will actually move. Um, and that if you look on this side, uh, what we're seeing is that we've actually worked out the ways to this. Uh, so you can get able to actually steer a board and be on it. And so what we have to do is now couple these up. We do have to do a lot of perceptual neuroscience to tune it just right. In the future, we'll have, we'll have a quite a range of this. So we'll have something that is very, very like calm and just a very calming environment where the person can sit on the, on the water, look out, maybe they're rocking very gently. Uh, they, you know, there's the sound of the ocean, there's all of these elements. And then I'm hoping that, you know, surf therapists can actually be in the room and doing kind of talk therapy and other types of therapeutic approaches while this person is in this environment to try to totally a mock up because you'll see that this person is not wearing any safety harness and I will never put anybody on this board without them wearing a safety harness. Uh, but in the future, there'll be an overhead support system that uh, has them in a full body harness for protection. And then, you know, we can scale up the challenge of the wave and hopefully they can have a, a lot of fun. So um, I just wanted to share this with you. I'm so excited to be here and uh, thank you for all your support and all the great.